What would you do if you found out something you cherished was possessed? Would you try and throw it away? Destroy it? Maybe sell it to some unsuspecting buyer? And how did it become haunted in the first place? Those are the questions we're going to ask as we explore those very objects. Some you might be familiar with, others so obscure that they've been lost to the sands of time until now. I'm your host, Evan O'Hare. Welcome to Haunted Objects. Today we're going to take a look at your very own Tinkerbell, giving you the gifts of protection. A horror film so diabolical that it's said to have control over its creator. So before you buy that trinket at a garage sale or accept that family inheritance, Take a look at these haunted objects. Thanks for watching Haunted Objects. Make sure to subscribe to our channel, like this video, and click the bell so you can be notified when new episodes of Haunted Objects goes live. Now back to the show. Fairies hold mystical powers that are not known to exist in any other beings as well as a keen place in people's hearts. They are indeed regarded as very special creatures. They possess a warm and positive inner energy, and that can be helpful to people around them. Imagine for a moment your very own Tinkerbell, giving you the gifts of protection, bringing forth good fortune, enhanced senses, and clairvoyance. Also referred to as guardians, they are portrayed as aggressive in their protection of their keepers. In fact, in some communities and cultures, they are so revered that their very presence, though without a shred of evidence, must always be respected and even acknowledged. Case in point is the ferry bridge located in the Isle of Man. There are similar locations around the world, but this is by far the most known. In fact, the superstition is so in practice that taxi drivers and motorists will slow down and encourage any and all passengers to join them in the greeting of fairies. Coaches even carry an automated announcement foreshadowing the passing over the bridge. It is deemed incredibly disrespectful not to do so and assumed misfortune will be passed on to those who do not comply. Or even worse, make mockery of such customs. We have one such account from an unfortunate traveler who not only sniffed their nose at such a request, but followed it with a chuckle or two. Right, this was the time when we went to the Isle of Man. Been a couple of times since, but this was the first time that we actually went. And they are really into their fairies over there and um, if you if you will treat them or make fun of them or something they always say that something will happen to you well we went on to this trip we got onto the coast the south part of the island great but we had to come back over the fairy bridge and this is like a small little uh well it's like a humpback um segment in the road it's not a massive huge bit a little stone bridge and at the si either side of the bridge, there are pendants, there are flowers, there are trinkets of all kind that the, the Manx people and some of the visitors leave for the, uh, the fairies. And uh, as we were getting towards this bridge, the coach driver said, well, whatever you do, say hello to the fairies and wave. If you don't, something will happen to you. Me and my, myself and a lady behind me, was called Barbara, and we both said at the same time, what utter garbage, what utter rubbish. So we were coming up to the ferry bridge and we'd got grown men, big strapping men, and husband is the same, waving to the fairies, hello fairies, good morning fairy. Uh, myself and Barbara didn't bother, we just sat there lapping, codswall up. Fine. So the driver said, because you're sitting at the front of the coach, the driver said, you didn't say hello to the fairies. You didn't acknowledge the fairies. No, rubbish. 
you'll be sorry. Oh, yeah, right, fine. So we continued the tour around the island, got back to Douglas. Um, we were going to go to uh, some pub on Douglas Seafront. So my husband and myself were walking along, and for some unknown reason, I just don't know to this day what happened, I happened to fall over and fall down a manhole. So I had to be got out of the manhole and taken to the hospital. All my leg was all cut, all my knee was all bandaged up. So I'm there hobbling around Douglas. Got back to the hotel, hobbling around the hotel with a great big bandage on me. Got down the following morning for breakfast, hobbled down there to breakfast. Um, Who should come in about two minutes later than Barbara who had also made fun of the fairies, came walking through with her arm in a sling because she'd broken her arm in two places because she'd gone dancing on the Monday night and she'd fell over on the dance floor and broke her arm. Now, whether that was the fairies or not, who knows, really couldn't say. But needless to say, the next time we went out the coach trip and we had to go over the fairy bridge, Myself and Barbara were the first ones that said hello and waved. We were actually shouting and saying hello to the fairies two miles before we got to the bridge. The island is host to the prestigious TT event, during which it is well advised and not too unusual for competing drivers to visit the bridge, greet the fairies, and be bestowed with good fortune. Many crashes have even been attributed to the choice not to do so. What if you could find a vessel that claimed to contain one such good fortune giving, keeper protecting fairy? A starting point to bonding the purchaser with that noble mystical creature. One bonding session later, and you shall be enchanted. Apparently they come in a variety of items, from an innocuous ring or other similar pieces of jewelry to a statue, perhaps even a tapestry. It seems however you desire to carry your Tinkerbell, there is a seller out there ready to meet your needs. But how would these mystical creatures find themselves housed in such throwaway items? And more importantly, why? Why would they want to, or even allow themselves to? Such creatures would also surely not wish themselves to be mere charms to be tapped into, or do they genuinely enjoy helping us? on our magical journey. Do they long for companionship that only we can provide? Once upon a time, Hollywood didn't shy away from the grim and the lurid. 80s films like Popcorn or the diabolical horror film Anguish pushed the envelope of possession featuring a possessed film within a film concept. See what happens when you disobey mother? Anguish. (sighs) But what happens when a filmmaker actually does lose himself in the world of Satanism while making a film? We're about to find out. You see that picture? Do you like her? You can have her. Described as a trans-dimensional tragic drama with a twisted sense of humor, originally planned to be shot in his mother's bedroom, the filmmaker was able to obtain another location. This one more fitting to the theme of Satanism, a flat above a sandwich shop to be precise but he found himself in the courtroom when the issue of budget and friendship became a long-term conflict of interest. What was the name of that film? Uh, the film is Refical, Judge. Refical? Yeah, Refical. It's uh, Lucifer spelt backwards. But why is there reference to Lucifer, sir? OK, because the film is a dark arts project, Judge. Everything in the world of Satanism, Satanism is not what it appears to be. It's all back to front, topsy-turvy sort of thing. So I thought it would be an interesting concept for me to uh, switch it about. The filmmaker David Lamont delved headfirst into the research. 
As the writing process went on, David found himself slipping further and further into the dark world he was attempting to expose. The activity didn't stop at David's door, and once filming began, it seemed whatever had been attached to him was channeling poltergeist activity through him. By his own admission, the filming of the short film was fright with terrifying activity. Exploding candles, sending shrieking actresses fleeing to the toilet, unexplained footsteps, ruining days of mercilessly planned shots. The acts were so bad that the filming was halted and never resumed. David had spent approximately 1,200 pounds, and when additional cost arose, he turned to his friends who claimed to have given him a personal loan to help him complete enough footage to enable him to launch a funding campaign with the idea of paying the loan back. Now, you've understood what's been said there. Yes. Did you know about any of these things? He did mention this, these things, yes. And that's what briefly, made us... Though, yeah, briefly. And that's what made us uneasy to keep asking him, you know, for money. Because at the end of the day, he's still our friend. And I personally felt like I didn't want to drive him off the edge knowing all that he'd been through. They also claim, although David mentioned them being executive producers, they did not opt into that deal. When filming stopped, time continued to pass and no word from David. The numerous issues and continued research into the occult had made David very, very unwell. So much darkness did he feel he had absorbed that he describes it as a two years of absolute hell. David found himself completely enveloped by the demonic forces he had seemingly opened a door to and became increasingly miserable, distressed, and shut off. What's the matter, Boyle? Do it. Do it? Do it. No! No! It was only when he sought the help of a medium that he began the long and turbulent road to feeling better. You believed frankly, that you were getting more and more seriously affected by virtue of this research you had done? Yes. What did you do in order to make yourself well or to attempt well, to? Well, I went to seek the help of a wonderful medium. I was diagnosed as having dark energy feeders attached to my aura, known as Archons. Did you feel that she managed to help you? Absolutely, it? yeah. Thank you very much. David finally understood the power this film had over his life. Whilst it appears his friends were concerned and tried to be patient, they ultimately felt they had no option but to challenge him in TV court. Good news, horror fans. It seems that David is not done with the story of Rethical. In fact, he regularly posts on his social media updates of new projects and frequently refers to Rethical Falls. A feature-length film which will incorporate the original story, but the twist is that the main narrative focuses on the true and terrifying story of him making the film. Exceptional way to turn the dark into light. Hmm. Can a film be possessed? If you surrounded yourself in evil, could it take hold of your very essence? According to this filmmaker, you better not mess with the devil. Whether the cursed objects shown this evening are of myth, urban legend, or fantastical paranormal occurrences is for you to decide. I hope I haven't left you eyeballing your shelves and contemplating your latest thrift shop purchase. But if I did, get in touch. Tell us about your possessed possession. And maybe we'll feature it right here on Haunted Objects.